All right, so let's start working out the solutions to the fourth tutorial. Uh, let me start with the first problem, which is actually a very instructive and very important problem that will teach you how to uh, approach the postulates of quantum mechanics. Okay. So to begin with, you are given three operators and later you will find in your course on quantum mechanics that these are what are called the angular momentum operators. You are given LX, LY and LZ. Okay. Now you could go ahead and quickly verify for yourselves that these three operators do not commute. And in fact, if you take the commutation of LX and LY, you will get ILZ and so on and so forth, cyclic permutations, just like with the Pauli matrices. Okay. So let's start with the first subdivision. What are the possible values one can obtain if LZ is measured? Well, looking at LZ, we see, we see that this is equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. Now, the postulates of quantum mechanics tells, tells you that if an operator is measured, if an observable is measured, the only possible results of measurement is one of the eigenvalues of the operator. Okay. So we should go ahead and find out the eigenvalues of LZ. But if you look at LZ, LZ is already diagonal and the diagonal values are basically the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues of LZ are 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, now suppose we take the state in which LZ equals 1. In this state, what are LX, LX square and the uncertainty delta LX? Okay, so let's uh, calculate this step by step. We are in the state, so let me call this state LZ equal to 1 like this, okay? So first we have to understand what this state is. So let, let us work out the eigenvector corresponding to this state. The eigenvector corresponding to the LC equal to 1 is given by the eigenvalue equation. L, LZ operator acting on the state LZ equal to 1 is 1 times LZ equal to 1. Yes. So let's call this some column vector with entries x1, x2, and x3. And you know how to do this, but let me just do it for completeness sake. acting on x1, x2, and x3 equals x1, x2, and x3. Okay, this is the eigenvalue equation corresponding to the eigenvalue plus one. Now, if you look at this equation, you get three equations, x1 equals x1, x2 equals zero, and minus x3 equals x3, which implies x3 is also equal to 0. So the eigenvector corresponding to LZ equal to 1, the state is trivially given by 1, 0, 0. And the length of this vector is already 1, so there is no need to normalize this. For completeness 6, we can also write down the corresponding eigenvectors for 0 and minus 1. For 0, it will be 0, 1, 0. And for LZ equals minus 1, the state would be 0, 0, 1. Okay. This you could quickly verify. Now, we are in the state LZ equal to 1. And in this state, we are expected to find the average value of the LX operator. So what is LX? LZ equal to 1. LX, LZ equal to 1. What is this expectation value? Well, these are all real vectors. So the corresponding bra is just the row vector. So let us work, work this out explicitly. So LX, which is just a shorthand for uh, this LZ equal to one, LX, LZ equal to one. So this is the same as this, okay? Is equal to the row vector one, zero, zero, times LX, which is a one over root two times 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, times 1, 0, 0. What would this be? This would be 1 over root 2, 1, 0, 0, 
what is this column vector? This is zero, one, zero. And therefore, the average value of Lx in this state is just zero. If you remember, we actually solved a very similar problem in a previous tutorial. Okay. What is the average value of Lx squared? This is a very important point. Just because the average value of Lx is equal to zero doesn't mean that the average value of Lx squared is also equal to zero. Because remember, the average value of the square of the operator is not equal to the average value of the operator whole square, okay? These two quantities are in general not equal to zero. In fact, the difference between these two quantities is precisely equal to the variance, this operator, okay? So let us calculate the average value of Lx square. To compute the average value of Lx square, we'll do the exact same thing, but first we need to figure out what this Lx square operator is. So Lx square is, there's two factors of one over root two, so there's a one half times the matrix zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero times, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. I'm going to be saying a lot of zeros and ones in this tutorial. This is equal to one zero one zero two. Zero, zero, one. Okay. All right. So this is my Lx square operator, and I need to find out the average value of Lx square operator in this state. So the average value of Lx square operator is again. I'll take the one half outside and go back to one zero zero times this operator. This is equal to one half, one zero zero times the column vector one zero one. Okay, and this is just one half. Okay, so what is um, Delta Lx, Delta Lx in the state is basically the square root of the expectation value of Lx squared minus the square of the expectation value of Lx. So this is equal to one half minus zero. So this is one over square root of two. This is the uncertainty in the value of Lx that you measure in this particular state, okay. Part C, find the normalized eigenstates and eigenvalues of Lx in the LZ basis. Okay, so you know how to figure out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors pretty easily. So Lx, again, is given by 1 over root 2, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay, so figuring out the eigenvalues is straightforward. This is the characteristic equation. So if you do this, you would find that this is equal to minus lambda, one over root two, because there's a factor of one, one over root two outside, so you should not forget that, zero, one over root two, minus lambda, one over root two, zero, one over root two, minus lambda, equals zero. So this would be minus lambda times minus lambda, one over root two, one over root two minus lambda, minus one over root two times the determinant, one over root two, one over root two, zero minus lambda, this is equal to zero. The third determinant is equal to zero because this is multiplied by the number zero. So this is equal to minus lambda, 
lambda square minus half minus one over root two times minus lambda times one over root two equals zero. So what is this equal to? This implies that minus lambda cubed plus lambda over two plus lambda over two equal to zero or lambda cubed minus lambda equal to zero. If I take lambda outside, it gives me lambda squared minus one is equal to zero. So the three eigenvalues are lambda equal to zero plus minus one. Okay, so work out the eigenvectors now. So eigenvector corresponding to eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue plus one. What is this LX equal to one? This again, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Let's call this eigenvector x1, x2, x3 equals plus 1 times x1, x2, x3. Okay. So this gives you three equations. What are the equations? First equation is x2 equals square root of 2 times x1. The second equation is x1 plus x3 equals square root of 2 times x2. The third equation is x2 equals square root of oops, square root of 2 x3. Okay. So since one of this is arbitrary and has to be fixed by normalization, let us choose that to be x1 and write everything in terms of x1. So if I write this in terms of x1, this is x1 times 1 x2 is a square root of 2 times x1, so I'll put the square root of 2 here. And x3 is x2, x2 divided by square root of 2. So this is square root of 2 by square root of 2, which is just 1. Okay. And I will now normalize this. So I'll require that x transpose x equals 1. And if I fix the length, I'll fix x1. And if I do that, the length of this vector is simply equal to square root of 1 plus 2 plus 1, which is square root of 4, which is 2, right? So the normalized vector corresponding to uh, Lx is equal to 1 is then 1 half 1 root 2 1, okay? Now remember that the question is asking you, what are the eigenstates of Lx in the Lz basis? So I can write this as one half times one zero zero plus one over root two times zero one zero plus one half times zero zero one. And this is basically the LZ equal to one state. This is the LZ equal to zero state and this is LZ equal to minus one state. So the LX equals one state can be written as a linear combination of the three LZ states. LZ equals one plus one over root two, LZ equals zero plus one half, LZ equals minus one. Okay, so this is the solution to the problem. Of course, you can uh, go ahead and uh, write down the other two eigenvectors also, which I leave it to you to do. Um, so it's not very hard to do. So you would actually find that the Lx equal to zero would correspond to the uh, vector something like one over root two times one zero minus one and Lx equals minus one would correspond to one half one minus root two one. Okay. So you should go ahead and check that all, all these three states are orthogonal to each other. So Lx equal to one is orthogonal to Lx equal to zero and Lx equals minus one. And Lx equal to zero and Lx equals minus one are also orthogonal. 
and please go ahead and write the LX equal to zero and minus one states in terms of the LZ states, just as we have done for the LX equal to one state. That would be the solution to the second part of the problem. Okay, so we'll move on to part D. If the particle is in the state with LZ equal to minus one and LX is measured, what are the possible outcomes and their probabilities? Okay. All right. So the particle, the LZ value is measured and you're forcing the particle in the LZ equal to minus one state. And this state is basically given by zero, zero, one. So we'll write that a little more carefully. Okay, so this is the state in which you're forcing the particle. And now in this state, I am measuring the LX value. Well, obviously I'm going to get LX equal to plus one, minus one or zero because those are the only three eigenvalues. But what are the probabilities? The probabilities, the probability of getting the eigenvalue plus one would be the overlap of the LX equal to minus one state with the LX equal to one state. Right, the probability of getting LX equal to one would be the overlap of LX equal to one state with LZ equal to minus one state. This would be the amplitude, and the probability would be the absolute square of this amplitude, right? So we know what the LX equal to one state is. You can either use um, this one, this, this equation with the blue underline, or you can simply use the column vectors. They are both fine. If I use the um, uh, equation which I've underlined in blue, the advantage is that the orthonormality property is very clear. LZ equal to minus one, sorry, this is, um, yeah. LX equal to plus one state can be written as a linear combination of LZ equal to one, zero, and minus one. But since the three LZ states are orthogonal, the only thing that will contribute is the LZ equal to minus one component of LX equal to one. So this can be written as basically one half LZ, excuse me, LZ equal to minus one, LZ equal to minus one component squared, right? Because the overlap of LZ equal to zero with LZ equal to minus one is zero, and the overlap of LZ equal to one with LZ equals minus one is, is equal to zero. And this, over, this overlap, since these states are properly orthonormal, this is just equal to one. So this probability, the probability of measuring LX and getting the value one in the state LZ equal to minus one is one fourth. Okay, you can go ahead and compute the other probabilities in this particular fashion. Uh, I'll compute the other probability using the column vector, so you know that both are equally okay. So the LX equal to, let us say, zero state can be written as we just uh, gave you here in the uh, equation underlined by blue. So this is basically one over root two, one, zero, minus one, right? So the probability of getting LX equal to zero is the overlap of LX equal to zero with the state on which the measurement is carried out, which is LZ equal to minus one. So this is equal to more the LX equal to zero state is one over root two times the row vector one, zero, minus one. The LZ equal to minus one state is obviously zero, zero, one, one square. So this is one over root two square is just one half times one, zero, minus one, zero, zero, one square. And this is just one, so this is one half, okay? Now you can easily verify that the probability of getting, excuse me, LX equals minus one should be equal to one fourth. How would I simply write it down? Well, the total probability has to be equal to one. So I've already gotten one fourth and one half. So the, the other guy should be just one fourth, right? 
Uh, so this has stopped working. So let me. Ah, this is this is okay. All right. So this is how you compute the probabilities by measuring the overlap and taking the absolute square of the overlap. Okay. The last part of the problem, which is the which is also very interesting and, and a slightly tricky part of the problem, is this. So we are given a state. We are prepared. We have prepared the quantum system in the state which is given by one half one one root two. Right? Okay. This is the state that is given to us in the LZ basis. Okay. So I can, if I want, I can write the state psi as one half times LZ equal to one plus one half times LZ equal to uh, zero plus one over, um, what is this, root two LZ equal to minus one. Okay, now notice that this is a properly normalized state because psi psi, if you compute, this will be equal to one fourth plus one fourth plus one half, which is equal to one, okay? So the state that is given to you is uh, properly normalized, okay? Now I am measuring not LZ, but LZ squared, and I am getting the result one. So the question is, if I measure LZ, I'm, I'm gonna get one of these three, LZ equal to one or zero or minus one, and I know what the associated probabilities are. The probability of getting LZ equal to one is the square of this guy, which is one fourth. The probability of getting LZ equal to zero is the square of this guy, which is one fourth. And the probability of getting LZ equal to minus one is the square of this guy, which is one half, right? So I know these three quantities, but I'm not measuring L LZ, but I'm measuring LZ squared, and I'm getting plus one. Now, there are two ways of getting LZ squared equal to plus one. It could be either in the state LZ equal to minus one or plus one because the eigenvalues of LZ squared, LZ squared are basically the eigenvalues of LZ squared because the eigenvalues of a matrix, the proper matrix is the uh, square of the eigenvalues of the matrix. So this would be the eigenvalues of LZ are one, zero and minus one. So which means the square of those guys are one, zero and one. So if I measure LZ square on the state with LZ equal to plus one or minus one, I'm gonna get plus one. So if I measure LZ square and I get plus one, I am I have to be either in the LZ equal to minus one state or LZ equal to plus one state. But how do I know which state? Well, so this is the case of, uh, so remember whatever uh, you were taught about degeneracy, right? So what is the state, what are the possible states into which this state psi can be projected into? It has to be projected into the subspace with LZ square equal to one. This can correspond to either LZ equal to plus one or LZ equals minus one, which means I have to project the state psi into a linear combination of the states with LZ equal to plus one and minus one, which means the state that this uh, system is forced into after the measurement of LZ square equal to plus one is the projection operator on psi, but this projection operator is projecting it into the subspace with LZ equal to one, this is the projection operator that projects into the space LZ equal to one and plus LZ equal to minus one. This acting on psi would be the state into which the system is forced. Why should it be forced into the system? Because you're measuring LZ square and you're getting the value plus one, which means the system could either be in the LZ equal to plus one state or minus one state. So you have to take a linear combination of both possibilities. So once you recognize this, the mathematics is straightforward. Uh, this is basically the direct product of two vectors. Let me actually compute that explicitly. LZ equal to one state is, oops, excuse me, one zero zero 
times the rho vector one zero zero LZ equal to minus one is the state zero zero one times the rho vector zero zero one acting on psi which is one half one half one over root okay so let's compute this matrix this matrix is one this is very easy to do because it's a whole bunch of zeros this is also easy to do because everything is going to be zero except the last guy acting on this and if you work if you work this out you would see that the state into which the system is the system collapses is given by one zero 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 one acting on initial state so this is one half zero one over root okay now i can go ahead and normalize the state if i normalize the state this is of course not a normal state um what would i get this would be the length of this guy is square root of one half plus one fourth which is square root of three fourth so it should be two over square root of three one half zero one over root two it should be one over root three zero square root of two over three So you can verify that this is the correct normalization because the length of this vector is one third plus two third, which is one. Okay. Now, if LZ is measured immediately afterwards, what are the outcomes and what are the respective probabilities? Well, we are in the subspace corresponding to LZ equal to plus one and LZ equal to minus one. So if I measure LZ, it is of immediately afterward. I'm going to get either LZ equal to plus one or LZ equal to minus one. What are the probabilities? Well, the probability of getting LZ equal to plus one is the overlap of LZ equal to plus one with psi prime mod square. So this is equal to the LZ equal to plus one state is one, zero, zero. And this state is one over root three, zero, square root of two over three mod square. So this would be one third. Okay, so there is a 33% chance that I'm getting, I'm going to get LZ equal to plus one, and the probability of getting LZ equal to minus one is zero zero one. One over root three zero square root of two over three mod square. So there's a two third probability of getting LZ equal to minus one. Okay, so that is how you approach this problem. This is a very important problem. In case you were not able to solve this, uh, please go through this solution carefully once more and make sure you understand every aspect of it because this, the solution of this problem teaches you quite a bit about uh, the postulates of quantum mechanics. Okay, all right. So let's move on to the second problem. The second problem is on a function space. So it tells you that you are given a particular basis vector, which are basically the uh, Fourier series, as you well know, 2 over L sine n pi x over L. Okay, now you're in a Hilbert space, um, L2, between 0 and L, the length of the Hilbert uh, linear vector space, the length of the x coordinate is basically L. And I'm using the definition of scalar product, which is zero to L, F star of X, G of X, DX. Okay, so for this definition of scalar product, you are to prove that uh, these basis vectors are indeed proper basis vectors and that they are orthonormal. Okay, so to prove they are orthonormal, I have to show that EM, EN overlap is mn which means it is equal to one if m equals n and is equal to zero if m is not equal to so let's calculate em en 
using this definition. Now remember that since the function given to me is sine, which is a real function, f star is basically just f. So there is two factors of square root of two over L. So there's an overall factor of two over L, zero to L sine m pi x over L times sine n pi x over L dx, okay? Now using some very simple trigonometry, you can actually show that this is equal to zero to L one half of uh, so cosine a minus b minus cosine a plus b, right? So cosine m minus n pi x over L minus cosine m plus n pi x over L. Remember that m and n are integers. m, n are integers. Which means m minus n is also an integer and m plus n is also an integer. So this is equal to one over L times integration of cosine is sine. So sine m minus n pi x over L times something uh, L over m minus n pi minus, so there's a minus here and a plus here because cosine integration is minus sine plus something which is m plus L over m plus n pi times sine m plus n pi x over L. And I have to evaluate this between L and zero. But this is equal to zero because if I put the upper limit, sine of any integer, n minus n or n plus n sum, any integer, let us say p, pi, if x is equal to l, l divided by l cancels, and sine p pi for any integer p is equal to zero. And sine zero is, is also equal to zero, so this is trivially equal to zero, okay? But there is one small thing that we missed in this uh, calculation, and this small thing is the evaluation of this guy. So notice that this derivation is true for all values of m and n, except if m is equal to n. Because if m is equal to n, we are not integrating a cosine function anymore, right? Because we are just integrating one. So if m equals n, I have to do this slightly differently. The second part is okay. So this, uh, the part um, that I, let us say, uh, the curly bracket part is always okay. This to this is always okay. But if m equals n, if m equals n, the second part is just sine to m, which is just another integer. That is fine. But if m equals n, this, the first part just becomes equal to one. So I'm not integrating cosine, I'm just integrating one half dx, right? So I have to treat the m equals n case separately. If m equals n, then this is equal to two over L times one half, this uh, overall one half factor times integral zero to L cosine, uh, zero is just one, so this is equal to integral dx, which is equal to one, okay? This is actually perfect for our purposes because this shows that if m equals n, the overlap is one, and if m is not equal to n, the overlap is zero. So we have just proved that em, en is equal to delta mn, and that the given basis em is thus, a proper orthonormal basis. Okay, so that is the solution of the second problem. Okay, now this is a straightforward integration. Now let us move on to the third problem. Okay. So what is the third problem? The third problem tells you, this is actually a very interesting problem. So notice that in any polynomial space, I can simply choose as my basis vectors. Remember that I can write any polynomial P of X as A0 plus A1X plus A2X squared plus A3X cubed plus blah, 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 right? If it is a finite dimensional polynomial, I'll stop with some X to the N. But if I want an infinite dimension, uh, then I can keep going on and on and on till, X, till uh, infinite powers of X. For example, E to the X has infinite powers of x, right? So what are my basis vectors? I can think of this as a linear expansion in terms of the basis functions 
basis vectors or basis functions, one, x, x squared, x cubed, and so on and so forth, right? Because any vector in this space, in this polynomial space, can be written as a linear sum of all these guys. But it is not at all clear how the orthonormality works if I choose this guy to be the basis function. For example, if I were to go from minus infinity to infinity, then it is obviously clear that this is not a proper basis set because if I simply choose the previous orthonormal, uh, sorry, the previous definition of scalar product from minus infinity to infinity, um, f star of x, g of x dx, then this obviously will not work because if I take the dot product of any of these two basis vectors, let us say one and x, right? which I will write in this crazy notation. This is equal to minus infinity to infinity times one minus x times dx. This is obviously not equal to zero. So uh, this does not mean that we should throw away this set of basis vectors, but we should choose the definition of our scalar product properly with some weight function. So this is the problem. So use the scalar product minus in sorry, excuse me. F G equals minus infinity to infinity F star of X G of X E to the minus X square DX. Okay. Now uh, it's important that I choose E to the minus X square. I cannot choose a normalization function like E to the plus X square for this problem because the whole point is that everything is blowing up. And if I choose E to the X square, things are going to blow up even, even faster. So I need to ensure convergence of the scalar product. So I have to choose something that rapidly goes to zero at plus minus infinity and E to the minus X or E to the minus X. Sorry, E to the minus X square is a good, uh, is a, is a good function because in the space between minus infinity and infinity, e to the minus x square always goes to zero. Right? I cannot choose e to the minus x because at minus infinity, e to the minus x blows up. But if I were to choose my uh, uh, the length of the space between zero and infinity, for example, instead of minus infinity and plus infinity, then e to the minus x might be a good choice. Okay, but not for minus infinity to plus infinity. All right. So from Using this definition of scalar product, we have to construct the set of basis functions from the basis that is given to us, uh, a set of basis that is proper in the sense that it is orthonormal and uh, one obviously has to use Gram-Schmidt procedure to do this. Okay, Gram-Schmidt procedure. So let's recall what Gram-Schmidt procedure is. Suppose if I have a bunch of vectors E1, E2, E3, etc. that are not orthonormal, then the first step is to normalize E1. Okay, let's call this E1 prime. That is your first basis vector. The second step is to subtract out any component of E2 that lies along the direction of E1 prime. So construct Take off from E2 any component that lies along the direction of E1 prime. Okay, and then you normalize this. This gives your second basis vector. The third step is to construct, take the third basis vector and subtract off the amount of the third basis vector along the direction of the second one and along the direction of the first one. Okay. And then normalize this combination. This would give you the third basis vector and you keep going. Okay. Till you get tired. All right. So let's adapt this procedure for the given function space problem at hand. So the first vector that is given to us is one, okay? So what is the first basis vector? Now you obviously trivially say that it is also equal to one because uh, one is already normalized. The length of one is just one. 
but that is not true. It, it also depends on the definition of the scalar product, okay? If I choose this as my definition of scalar product, then obviously the length of the overlap of one, one is just not defined properly, right? So I have to choose the scalar product that is given to me, which is this guy. So what is the length of this vector? The length of this vector is the overlap of this vector. Oops, excuse me. Is integral minus infinity to plus infinity one times one times e to the minus x squared dx. Okay. Now in this problem, we are going to be using these Gaussian integrals quite often. So let me actually do a bunch of them uh, so that it's easy for us to understand. This, as you know, is a Gaussian integral. So you should by now know that e to the minus ax squared dx is given by square root of pi over a. Okay. I hope this is clear. If not, the proof for this is very straightforward. Just square this integral and go to polar coordinates and you should be able to prove this in a second. Okay. Now we will use a very simple trick. Uh, we, we want to uh, compute integrals like minus infinity to infinity x e to the minus a x squared dx. This is very easy to do. Why? Because I'm going from all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is an odd function of x and this is an even function of x. So for every positive contribution on one side, there'll be an equal negative contribution on the other side. So any odd function times e to the minus a x squared integrated between minus infinity and plus infinity would give me zero. So ultimately, I want to calculate things like minus infinity to infinity x squared e to the minus a x squared dx and x to the 4 e to the minus a x squared dx and so on and so forth, right? So let's calculate integral minus infinity to infinity x squared e to the minus a x squared dx. There is a neat little trick you to find man, that helps us calculate this using nothing more than just this formula, okay? All I, all I want to do is I'm going to treat this a, which is actually a constant, as some kind of a variable, okay? And then I'll finally treat this to be a constant and you differentiate under the, under the integral sign. So you take this equation and differentiate this with respect to a on both sides. So d d a, I don't want to use green, but I will use blue. Okay. So, d d a minus infinity to infinity e to the minus a x squared dx is equal to, of course I have to differentiate the right hand side also, d d a square root of pi over a. Okay. So I hope this is clear. Um, so this is equal to now, since the integration is over x and I'm differentiating with respect to a, I can easily take this differentiation in, inside the integral. The right hand side, of course, is basically the differentiation of one over square root of a, which is square root of, oops, square root of pi over two times a to the three half. Okay, and the left hand side is uh, with a minus sign. The left hand side is integral minus infinity to infinity. If I differentiate with respect to a, I get a minus x square out because I would treat x as a constant because I'm differentiating with respect to a, remember. And this is equal to minus square root of pi over 2a to the 3 half. And I can cancel the minus sign on both sides and I can get x square e to the minus a x square dx is basically square root of pi over two times a to the three half, okay? So I can go ahead and differentiate this with respect to a one, one, one more time and I will get x to the four e to the minus a x square dx and this would be equal to, which you can easily verify, which I have already worked out, is this guy. Okay, so on and so forth. So this is a neat little trick to deal with Gaussians and functions of Gaussians, um, which is basically uh, in differentiate under the integral sign, assuming that this constant A is some kind of a continuous variable. Of course, at the end, we will just put the value of A that we are interested in. So we want to calculate 
integral minus infinity to infinity x square e to the minus a x square sorry x square e to the minus x square dx. So in our case, x is a a equals one. So put a equal to one on both sides. So you would simply get this is equal to square root of pi over two. And for our case, x to the four e to the minus x square dx. If I again put a equals one, I'll get three square root of pi over four. So on and so forth. Okay. All right. So with this out of the way, let us go ahead and normalize. Um, normalize the first guy. The first vector is, of course, normalize one. Okay, which seems like a very funny way of doing it. But the length of the first vector is not just one because our definition of scalar product is different. So the length of this guy, the overlap of this guy, is minus infinity to infinity e to the minus x square dx, which is square root of pi. Okay. So if I want to normalize this, if I want to make the length equal to one, I have to divide by the square root of this number. So my first vector e1, I mean, this is a very lousy notation because this is in function space, but I'm simply writing the ket e1 to make a connection between what you know already. So this is uh, strictly speaking, not the right notation. So, but basically this is equal to one over pi to the one fourth. Okay, that is your first guy. So what's the second step? The second step is to take the second vector and subtract off the amount of the second vector that lies along the first vector. So this amount is minus infinity to infinity. The overlap of x and one, x and e1 is basically x times e1, which is one over pi to the one fourth times the norm, uh, weight function e to the minus x square dx. Right? Of course, this, this, this is an odd integral because e to the minus x square is an even function, x is an odd function. So this is basically just x. Okay, so which means there is no amount of uh, the second vector that is along the first vector given our definition of scalar product. All right. So now we have to normalize the second vector. So this is basically normalizing this is minus infinity to infinity. The overlap of x with itself is x square times the weight function e to the minus x square dx. But we already know that this guy is equal to square root of pi over two. So the second vector E2 is basically divide by one over square root of pi over two to the one half X. Okay. So this is square root of two divided by root pi X. This is my second vector, okay? So let's move on. The third one is, I have to take the third vector, which is x squared, and subtract off the amount of this along the second vector, which is minus infinity to infinity, x squared times, the second vector is square root of two over root pi, x times e to the minus x square dx and I have to subtract the amount along the first vector which is minus infinity to infinity x square. The first vector is just a constant which is given by 1 over square root of square root of pi. Okay, let me write it as just pi to the 1 fourth. e to the minus x square dx. Okay. So remember that in every step, whether you're calculating the nod or the scalar product, you have to uh, put in this uh, weight function e to the minus x square, which ensures absolute convergence of all these integrals. Okay. Now this first guy is an odd function because it is x cubed times e to the minus x square. So this just goes to zero. The second guy, of course, is an even function. So this is equal to x square minus one over pi to the one fourth times integral x square e to the minus x square dx, which we have worked out to be square root of pi over two. 
Okay, this is my second um, vector. So I can write this, sorry, the third, my third vector, this is equal to x square minus uh, pi to the one fourth over two. Okay, I hope all these calculations are correct. If there is any mistakes, please uh, catch me and let me know so I can correct them. So this is my third basis vector. Now I have to make sure to normalize this. So normalize this. How would I normalize this? I would calculate the length of this guy or the norm of this guy. The norm of this guy is minus infinity to infinity. X pi fourth over two times the same thing e to the minus x square dx. Okay, so this is equal to minus infinity to infinity. The first term is x to the fourth e to the minus x square dx. The second one is the square of this guy is square root of pi over four minus infinity to infinity e to the minus x square dx. And the mixed term is two times square root of, oops, excuse me, pi to the one fourth over two times x square a to the minus x square dx. I hope that is right. So this is equal to x to the fourth is given by three square root of pi over four plus square root of pi over four times the Gaussian integral is just square root of pi. plus the third term is minus pi to the quarter, x squared into the minus x squared is square root of pi over two. Okay. So this is three square root of pi over four plus pi over four minus pi to the three half over four. So this vector would simply be equal to, um, the, the count this is a third one. So let's call this whatever this is equal to some L. So one over root L times the vector x squared minus pi to the one fourth over two. Okay, and then you can, uh, sorry, this is not showing up. So let me stop share and share again. So you could keep going and uh, construct the orthonormal set of vectors in the uh, basis using this. And uh, you, you would see a pattern emerging and I'll, I'll leave it for you to figure out the pattern. Uh, of course, if I've made any mistake along the way, you would not get the pattern. So it's, it's very important that you check my calculations. And the pattern is that you would actually find that these are all, what we have basically done is to generate what are called the Hermite polynomials. And we would actually see Hermite polynomials in quantum mechanics when we solve for the quantum harmonic oscillator, but that is for a different day. So this is how you solve for uh, the set of basis functions, even though you're not starting out with a set of orthonormal basis functions, using a proper definition of the scalar product that ensures that in the Hilbert space that you're interested in, all the scalar products converge. Okay. So that's basically the fourth tutorial and we will stop at this point and if you have any questions please email me or uh, wait for our interaction session this week.